Hello, everyone, and welcome to Talking Hoosier Baseball. I am your host, Brian Tonsoni, and this week, the Indiana Hoosiers went 2-2 two and two and won an important weekend conference series over Illinois. Here's a quick recap of the week. Wednesday, the Hoosiers traveled to their rival up north and lost a close one, 5-3. to three. The final line, Indiana, three runs, nine hits, no errors. Uh, that team up north, uh, five runs, ten hits, no errors. Connor Manis picked up the loss to fall to 1-2 and two on the season. Ryan Feynman, Matt Lloyd, and Matt Gorski each had two hits, including an incredible inside-the-park home run by Matt Gorski. On Friday, the Hoosiers returned to the BART for conference play versus Illinois, and the Hoosiers lost their fourth game in a row, 3-2 to two after scoring the first two runs in the bottom of the first. Illinois, three runs, nine hits, no errors. Indiana, two runs, six hits, no errors. Jonathan Stever picked up the loss despite a very strong effort on the mound. The lack of timely hitting that has plagued the Hoosiers for over a couple weeks, again, was evident at the BART. However, Drew Ashley did have two hits on the night. Saturday, IU came back and defeated Illinois 2-1 to one in a very key win in a, in a walk-off fashion by Drew Ashley, who had three hits in the game and in the 12th inning uh, took one out of the BART for the game winner. Final line, Illinois, one run, five hits, no errors. IU, two runs, 10 hits, and one error. Matt Lloyd picked up the win going to 3-0 and on the season, pitching three and one-thirds innings of relief. Cam Beecham, with his very best start of the year, went six innings, uh, allowing no runs. Uh, Matt Gorski had two hits, and again, Drew Ashley had three. Timely hitting was, again, a little bit absent until that walk-off home run. But on Sunday... It seemed Ashley's homer had uh, awoken the bats uh, from their slumber, and IU brought out a great offensive attack and won 9-2. to two. Final line, Illinois, two runs, eight hits, one air. Uh, IU, nine runs, ten hits, and one air. And it was another outstanding starting effort by our starting pitchers. This time it was Tim Heron who went seven innings, allowing only two runs in one of the best starts of his career. The offense was jump-started by back-to-back homers from Scotty Bradley and Matt Gorski in the second. Justin Walker also went yard. Those three guys were the three guys who had multi-hit games for the Hoosiers. IU is now 31-10 and on the season and 9-5 and in conference place, currently in fifth place. Tonight, we start our show off with a special guest segment. Madison James is with us, and she is an outstanding young person, an outstanding fan of Indiana baseball, becoming one of the better ball hawks at Barkoff Stadium in tracking down uh, foul balls and home runs and batting practice, and she really enjoys the IU walk-up songs, and she is here to share with our listeners her five favorite walk-up songs. Uh, song. So Madison, it is nice to have you on the show. Let's hear what you have. Uh, Thank you, Brian. So um, I had it sort of like in a a top five list, like arranged from fifth to first. So coming in at number five, I'm not really a big fan of modern country, but my dad said I had to pick at least one. And among the choices, this was my favorite. It it really doesn't hurt that the this player hit a walk-off home run on Saturday. This player is Drew Ashley. The song is People Back Home by Florida Georgia Line. Coming in at number four, um... One of my favorite players. He changes his song every year, and he always does make interesting choices. While I preferred his choice from last year, this one's good, too. The player is Logan Sowers. The song is My Story by R. Kelly, featuring two chains, chains with a V. And number three, this one is technically a warm-up song since he's a relief pitcher. He also has a great handlebar mustache, and he actually drew it on the foul ball I got on Sunday. I bet you can guess who that is. BJ Sable. The song is God's Gonna Cut You Down by Johnny Cash. And at number two, I promise Dad did not pressure me to make this pick. I love this song, even if I'm way too young. (laughs) For tropical drinks, um, I really love the I love this song. The player is Colby Stratton. Song is Escape, the Pina Colada song by Rupert Holmes. 
And this is my favorite walk-up song this year, so it's still on the list, even though the player dropped the song this weekend, which made me very uh, sad. I'm hoping there may be a certain family member of this player watching from perhaps Canada that could convince him to change it back. The player is Matt Lloyd. And the song is Matt Lloyd. No, the player is Matt Lloyd, and the song is Informer by Snow. And that wraps up the top five IU based walk up songs for 2018. Great job, Madison. Madison, that is a fantastic segment by itself. Just a fantastic initial segment uh, for your first time on Talking Hoosier Baseball. And the walk up songs are an important part of baseball. They have it in the major leagues and it gets the players psyched up. And uh, as Madison has shown, uh, the fans also can align themselves uh, with the song. I know. Uh, Winter Coat and I uh, have often uh, remembered some of the the key songs. So, uh, Madison, thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to your contributions in the future. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. It is now time for Hoosier Highlights of the Week. Uh, That's kind of hard to follow, uh, (laughs) but we'll try. Um, My highlight of the week, that uh, this team was in a funk for about two weeks. They had won some games and then lost four in a row. A lack of hitting in key moments. Uh, and then they seemed to be pressing over the weekend. Uh, it seemed like the plate approach uh, was a struggle, bad decisions, and people caught on the base pass. And then some uh, debatable, as baseball strategy is always, uh, decisions by uh, the coaching staff, pinch hitting and bunting. It just looked like everyone was trying really hard to break that losing streak, and then it happened. Uh, it all seemed to go away with one swing of the bat. Uh, Drew Ashley, whose approach all year has been impressive, at least from for those of us here in the in the podcast and i think around indiana baseball he got some uh attention on d1 baseball article today as well great approach great result bam to uh a new game two game winning streak now and uh so my highlight is uh drew ashley uh chris we're going to send it to you for your high school uh highlight uh that we decided to bring every week and you have a really good highlight Uh, what do you have this week okay this week we're going to talk about michael dunkelberger He's a left-handed pitcher out of St. Joe's in South Bend, Indiana. Um, I've actually seen him pitch uh, this past June in the title game, the 3A title game. He pitched at Victory Field. And just to reason why we're bringing him up for the Hoosier highlight is he's had three starts this year. He's 3-0. and He's had 10 strikeouts, 11 strikeouts, and 12 strikeouts in his three starts. So he's off to a really great start. Um, and, and it feels a lot better to actually talk about someone who I've seen pitch. Um, he was really impressive at Victory Field. In the beginning of the game, he had a couple of base runners on, and, and, and it seemed like his control was a little off. But then he really turned it on. Uh, at one point, I think he had nine or ten guys out in a row. He's, he's not a big guy. He's six foot, maybe 180 pounds from what they have him listed. But the mound presence, you know, he really looked like he knew what he was doing out there. He had control. His body language was great, even when there was a little trouble in the beginning. Uh, he was impressive to watch. Uh, he, he threw a complete game that day, and he got St. Joe's their first ever 3A baseball title. And another thing that really uh, at least caught my eye in that game, the majority of the plays were Jasper fans. You know, they were playing Jasper in the game, and they had three quarters of the crowd easily. Not that St. Joe's didn't bring fans. They did bring a crew, but Jasper just – he was basically pitching in a hostile environment. And it didn't matter. He, he really did well. And he's starting off this year really well. Um, he was also named by Prep Baseball Indiana, second team all state to start the season. I mean, he keeps pitching like this. He might end up first team. I don't know. Um, something to also point out, on that second team all state, he's on there with two other IU future Hoosiers. And they were actually juniors, the only two juniors to make the, the preseason all state second team. Everybody else on that team was a senior. And that's Julian Greenwell out of Columbus East and Avery Short out of Southport. So, and that's forgetting the first team. There was four Hoosiers on that one, too. So I know there's a big thing going on, you know, inside out, you know, with Archie Mello. Uh, I think Coach Lamotis was on to this even a little before that because we have a ton of homegrowns coming. And uh, Michael Dunkelberger is just one of them. I'm really looking forward to seeing him in fall ball. Uh, and it's always good to know that help is uh, on the way. And, and, and as we've seen, I think Coach Lamonis does a good job of bringing players in, uh, especially some pitchers, and, and we've had excellent pitching. And that leads us into Josh. Uh, your, who's your highlight? 
Yeah, my Hoosier highlight this week is going to be Cam's start on Saturday. Um, we'd lost four in a row. It seemed like the snowball was getting bigger and bigger and picking up more momentum. And uh, Cam stepped up and just, you know, righted the ship, shut the door. He was dominant. Uh, six innings pitch, two hits, no runs. And at one point he had retired eight in a row before an error was committed. So we really needed that without – Paulie being able to pitch the last two weeks, and uh, it was it was great to see Cam step up. It's my Hoosier highlight. Great depth in in pitching is being developed, uh, and sometimes when you have a setback like an injury, uh, you have an opportunity. and And Cam uh, went; it was his best effort of the year, and and we need him, and and he can be dominant um, like that f for the next few weeks. Will be really make us a it'll really make us a good ball club. Carl, you're um. Welcome back to the show. Madison did a great job, dude. The, the pressure's on you. Uh, don't don't mess up because uh, we'll let you have it here. But what's your Hoosier highlight of the week? Uh, my Hoosier highlight of the week uh, is actually two of them in a similar vein, uh, which is I, I love just the, the good old-fashioned pitcher uh, hitter showdown. And this weekend, the Hoosier pitchers were facing up against arguably the best hitter in all of college baseball, uh, Bryn Spillane. And there were two particular at-bats. Uh, one was Friday night towards the end of the game with a pressure situation, runner in scoring position. Uh, Andrew Saul Frank facing up against Brent Spillane, and he was awesome, and he struck him out. Um, and then uh, another situation happened, not as much of a pressure, pressure situation, but uh, in an interesting turn, Coach Lamonis brought out Tommy Summer, a left-hander, to face the right-handed Spillane uh, when he already had a right-hander on the mound. Um, and then Summer immediately went and went and got behind three and zero, um, and then he battled his way and again got a strikeout of Spillane. So to see that guy go down twice in those two situations was was just was just awesome and uh, somewhat reminiscent of uh, of getting McKay of uh, of Herring getting McKay last year. So there's it's it's just great to see these really great guys go down to uh, to some of our pitchers. And it's an excellent point, too, and it's another example of when we say debatable situations, bringing in a left-hander to face a right-hander, the baseball book says don't do that. But what, uh, as, a, as a coach, sometimes you got to do what's in your gut, and you have statistical information, and you know your squad better than anybody who's at the rail, including this guy. And, and so uh, that was a uh, – I was wondering why the left-hander for the right-hander, and it showed that – uh, summer could come in and sell Frank has a lot of talent and at times has shown uh, the ability and it just was consistency with him. And it's good to see that maybe give him some confidence because again, in these uh, big 10 tournaments and regionals, you need a lot of arms uh, to be able to uh, compete and win. And, and we're starting to see that um, develop Cassie, your who's your highlight. Cassie. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, sorry, my Wi-Fi has been a little funky today, so it's kind of hit and miss. Um, my Hoosier highlight was I actually got to catch the game on my on Sunday on my way back from uh, Cincinnati. I was there for my soon-to-be sister-in-law's bachelorette party and didn't know until Sunday morning that I was going to have a shot to – to make the game, and man, what a game it was. I mean, the offense exploded, three home runs, nine runs on ten hits. The pitching was stellar. Gave up no extra base hits, no walks, no HPPs, average of just 13 pitches per inning, and Timmy is really making, making a statement that he wants to be that third weekend starter, and w right now, with if when Paulie's back healthy, we've got four guys who who can be that, those weekend starters. And, man, was that weather gorgeous, too. Sun, this, the whole weekend, but Sunday was absolutely gorgeous. So I guess I just have to not plan to come to the games. When I plan to come to the games, it's cold and wet. When I don't, sunny. Well, I'm sorry that I, I missed you on Sunday since Sunday's uh, my day off from in, Indiana baseball, but I'm glad you had a chance to stop by and – and uh, bring us luck and uh, get the bats going. So, I, you know, maybe it wasn't Drew Ashley. Maybe it was you, Cassie, uh, you know, turning left in 465 instead of 
going going straight home. So we're glad you can make it. It is now time for what everyone waits for, the Limo Hat Awards of the Week. And Chris, take it away. All right. Here is the Limo Hat. Um, we haven't explained it in a while, so I figured I would go over it real quick. What we do is we give out our version of helmet stickers. We have an offensive Limo Hat. Uh, we name it after Alex Dickerson. We have a pitching Limo hat we name after Joey Donato. And we have a defensive player of the week uh, Limo hat, which we name after the great Golden Glove, Tony Butler. So for this week, we have – now this one, again, I feel like this guy, the guy who didn't get it seems to get robbed by these amazing moments. Um, I believe he got robbed from a ball hit on the roof uh, the week that he had a real good week. And now this week – Drew Ashley, the Offensive Player Limo Hat Award. Of course, a freshman hits a walk-off home run. Amazing moment. Amazing moment to watch him run around those bases, get mobbed by his teammates at home plate. But he also had six hits, you know, during the week. And, and for a guy who didn't expect to play a lot, I mean, we didn't even know if he was going to be playing at all. Maybe an extra hitter once in a while, maybe a pinch hit guy. This guy's playing third every day. And that moment when he cracked that ball, I got to be honest, I didn't think I had a shot. And it just kept going and going and going. What a moment. And we needed it because, you know, you, you, you get caught up on the 27th out of a game. You better win that game. And we did. And Drew Ashley made sure of it. So he gets the offensive player of the week, Limo Hat, for uh, it, it's all about the It's all about the camper. It really is. It the really camper is. gives and, out it, good energy. Yeah. And it's so ironic that he wins a Limo Hat when the first real sign of any fan wearing a limo hat was his dad that day in fall ball. We didn't even know who he was at that time. And now he's the man with the camper. I, excuse me, the RV. The, the de <laughs> Ted's a, de a dentist, right? I believe he is. He claims to be. I, he claims to be, but I, I don't know if I can go see him this week. Because, That's what I'm saying. I mean, he's got to be so excited for his son hitting a walk-off home run if he's fixing some teeth. I mean, that's got to, you know, be extra painful, and he's not worrying about doing, you know. Uh, no. I wouldn't go he, see he's him just, in May. He no. Would, he's got to be mean, able to live off of this for at least a month. Yeah, he's got to have more. He's got to design more uh, people coming in in January and February so he can just take some some time off because this is too exciting. He he uh, was he was very exciting too. It's always good to see the family members excited as well. Oh, he good was choice. Pumped up. He was pumped up. Uh, defensively, I'm just going to back you up a half an inning in that game, and it was a ball hit uh, right center field gap. Uh, I believe there was a guy on first, two outs. So, obviously, he was going. Logan Sowers, defensive limo hat, making that grab in the gap. And, and I feel like we, we underrate him. I mean, I know Gorski and Kalitha are really good athletes out there. But I think Sowers plays a great outfield as well. He plays a great right. He's got a great arm. And in this case, it wasn't his arm. It was obviously him being able to get to a ball in the gap. And uh, he saved that run. So, he's going to get the defensive uh, player limo hat for this week. And then pitching-wise, uh, to be honest, it was between two great starts, and you got to pick one. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you can't cut the Limo hat in half. I would never even think to damage a Limo hat. So we're going to give it to Cam Beecham. Um, I feel like his was a little bit more dominant. Um, he only gave up two hits. He gave up no runs. And after Friday night, you know, we were a little down. You know what I'm saying? We lose that game. Steven was rolling in the beginning. Maybe we felt like, you know, we were going to add on to those two runs, and we didn't. And for Cam to come out there and, to be honest, give us more than we thought we were getting, okay? You tell me he went four, you know, I'd be like, great. You know, he, this guy went six, two hits. Um, he really set the tone. He gave it to Cal, and we got through the rest. So uh, for week 11, we have Drew Ashley offensive. We have Logan Sowers defensive. And we have Cam Beecham for the pitcher, Limo Hat. You know, that um... – the saving to run, Sowers saving to run. I I, I agree a hundred percent with you. And and the thing about Beecham is it impacted winning. And I think Beecham's start not only kept us in the game when we were struggling hitting and we win later in the twelfth, but it it turned the tide uh, and it allowed us to win the series, which is keeping us alive for a host and really keeping us alive um, in in the NCA. I mean, we're we're pretty good in the NCA. As Carl will share with you later, but I, I agree, impacting winning. Uh, has to be part of the, the limo hats, and I I, I have um, total agreement with you. But Carl, what who else caught your eye this week? Uh, maybe getting the cheese hat. Uh, I'm going to call out uh, Matt Lloyd for his uh, his relief pitching performance. 
Um, team was in a kind of a bind, uh, and I maybe I missed it, but I actually didn't see him warm up. <laughs> and coach came out there, took him off of first base, put him on the mound, and he battled, and uh, team got the win. And that was it's what, it's what you you know it's what he's there for, and he didn't seem to be complaining about the situation. Um, he just uh, controlled it, and he did what he usually does when he's on the mound in those tight situations, and he delivered, and I was very pleased. Good choice there, Cassie Cheese Hat. Well, Carl took the one that I was going to use, um, but I'm going to go with Matt Gorski on offense because he kind of did a little bit of everything. His uh, – his – he, I mean, he got hits, he hit a home run, he laid down sack bunts, he drew walk. He kind of did a little bit of everything for the team. And so I'm, I'm going to go with Matt Gorski on the offensive side. Uh, another great selection. Josh, cheese hat. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give my cheese hat this week to a, a young man um, named Thatcher uh, who attends a lot of the IU baseball games. And um, he stands over there on the first baseline, right field corner, and he usually ends up with do double digit balls each game. But uh, if you look at our out of here uh, home run tracker on the website or through the tweets, um, you'll notice that uh, the young man's given Wyatt Cross and then Drew Ashley their first home run ball. So he's retrieved those for him and then taken it down to the field after them. So I'm sure that's very special for Wyatt and Drew to have have those balls. And uh, so I'm going to give my cheese hat to Thatcher for, for ho hooking them up on that. And, and again, as Chris described the Limo hats, the cheese hats are just honorable mention. Uh, other players that we feel should have been in consideration for a Limo hat, but didn't get one uh, in, in honor of coach cheese, who, who made a great defensive play by the way, over the weekend, uh, okay. who might've earned his own hat, but they're honorable mention awards. And uh, th that story, I, I, I like that when I hear it in the pros, uh, a, a monumental home run or a first home run and the fans give it back to the player or, or give it back to the team. I, I think that is, a, is one of the neat things about uh, baseball. I, I, I will uh, move on to the next segment, but there's a lot. The t Stever and Heron probably should get cheese hats too for their efforts. Starting pitching is fantastic. Can't wait to get Pauly back. Uh, the nice thing going forward with Kentucky – and Louisville midweek is if we have four mid or four weekend starters, which I believe we do right now. One of them will have to go to the midweek, and uh, that will help us maybe uh, defeat those teams in, in midweek and help our resume. Speaking of resume, Carl, you have an update for us after the weekend. Uh, how are we looking? All right, uh, looking a lot. This is a this was a nice week. Granted, it was only two and two as far as the win losses go but a combination of uh, opponents uh, doing a little bit better, including San Diego, uh, who I'm always <laughs> talking about. Uh, and uh, the, the quality of opponents that we're playing, um, that team up north is cracked the top 60 in RPI. Um, us going up there and getting beat by them helped that, but uh, they've, they've also beaten a lot of other teams lately. So that has been uh, a, another addition to the overall resume. Um, and the resume has been a, been a big deal. So now that, that series gets added. The series Indiana just played against Illinois gets added. So that basically doubled the number of, of key series wins uh, and really makes the resume look better. Uh, the 20 RPI is there which is uh, six places higher than before and only four out of the traditional number uh, for the hosting consideration. Um, if you also look at, um, let's pull it up here. Okay, hold it. Um, you look at the needs report. Uh, Boyd's World does what's called a needs report, uh, basically saying what, what, how many, wins and losses do you need in order to get to the, uh, to a specific uh, ranking in the RPI by the end of the, the end of the season before the conference tournaments um, top 45, which is now considered what's normal for needing to get into the postseason consideration. Uh, we're only looking at a four and seven record needed to achieve that level and qualify. Uh, and that's should be <laughs> very easy. Uh, the next level, which is 32 to get a two seed, 
get into the consider the range for a two seed, only looking at six and five, um, and looking a little bit better than it was last week to get into the top sixteen for hosting consideration uh, is a nine and two finish, which would be uh, very good, um, especially considering we're going up against a a very hot Minnesota team uh, this coming week. Um, but it's not impossible. Uh, Kentucky and Louisville are very good teams, um, but they are they have struggled in midweeks. So the ability to go up against them in midweek games, I think we may have an edge, just like and just like what Brian was talking about. Um, and then you've got Maryland and Nebraska, who are name brand programs that have really been struggling this year. So I so I think nine and two is not an impossibility. It's not easy. It's not what I would say is by any means a lock. Uh, or something to count on, but it's not impossible. Um, so those are where we are as far as uh, you know, as far as the 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 RPI and trying to get wins to uh, to qualify for the for the tournament. Um, I will make a very brief discussion on the Big Ten. Um, the Big Ten is uh, currently still led by Michigan. Um, I kind of did my own little uh, prediction to towards the end of it. Um, I really do think that the way things are going to hash out, Minnesota is the team to beat right now. Um, and even beating Minnesota two to one over the weekend might not be enough to catch them. Um, however, you, you, you take that and you go, and I've done a, uh, a, a calculation where I basically plug the RPI formula into exclusively Big Ten conference games. Don't consider anything outside of Big Ten conference games. Um, and it looks very different from what the actual league standings look like. And it's part of this, the fact that there's an unbalanced schedule. And right now, uh, I actually have Iowa uh, being the strongest team in, in Big Ten play, even though they're nine and seven, because they have played a brutal schedule. Um, then, you have, uh, then you have Indiana as number two in that group. Uh, Minnesota close behind, because while they haven't played as tough a schedule, they have really uh, played well with their uh, 11 and three record. Um, Michigan's all the way at six, even though they're leading the league, league at 12 and two. And that's because they have played a cakewalk schedule. The only team of any consequence they've played is Iowa and they lost that series. And that's where their two losses came from. Um, this is going to get, you know, there's still more to hash out here, but this is the first time I, I, I I've looked at these numbers and felt that they were worth talking about. And, and I think they are worth talking about. Um, finally, uh, I did put together another mock field. Uh, this time I went all the way to 48 teams. So I filled out all the one, two, and three seeds, um, trying to get an idea of, uh, if the season ended today, where would things hash out? Um, I had, uh, Kentucky being a 15 seed and a host with Indiana going to Kentucky, but it was close. Um, it doesn't take much, it will not take much for Indiana to get into real hosting consideration. Um, and then one change, uh, and this actually, I actually differ from, from D1 this year, from this week, in that I have Kent State as the three seed um, while they had Louisville. Um, and the reasoning for that is mid-major three seeds uh, are most likely going to get priority uh, as far as being close to home due to the financial travel restrictions. Um, so if there's a, if there, if Kent State, it, they're right on the border between a three and a four seed. If they do get in, win their conference tournament for the MAC, and uh, and they're going to be close enough that I think they would be a priority for that three seed. D one thought they were in this regional as well, but they had Kent State as a four seed. Um, and those are conversations that you know we'll have in more detail as we get uh, closer to Selection Monday and uh, determining you know how this is all going to going to hash out and who the opponents are going to be. I'm sure the people selling tickets. Uh, would still prefer uh, uh, Kentucky, Indiana, Louisville as the one, two, threes. Um, but that is what I have for this week. Very good. And we're getting closer uh, three weeks to the end of the regular season. And these numbers will continue to solidify uh, as we go and, and add some wins. So, Cassie, it's time for your awesome stat report. Uh, what do you have to share with us this week? Yes. So, my stats are kind of limited this week with uh traveling all weekend and then actually ending up in the mechanics waiting room all morning with a dead alternator and battery so 
So I looked exclusively at the last couple of weeks from the start of the Ohio State series through Sunday. Um, so this is really just a limited view, no context, no context. I don't know what's normal for these stats. This is just what I found over the last couple of weeks. Um, I looked at free basis scoring, so walks, HBPs, errors, and how often those players that reach for free are scoring. And so, and so during this uh, drop in play with the few losses, uh, the Hoosiers have given up 28 walks or HBPs, uh, and eight of those have come around to score, including one that was a fielder's choice taking the place of a walk before scoring. And that's almost 30% of them are coming around to score, which seems a little high. The Hoosiers have also only committed five errors during that stretch, which is not too bad. Uh, and two of them came around to score. So that's a total of 33 runners who reached for free with 10 of them scoring for again, right around 30%. But the team as a whole, the team has given up a total of 22 runs in those same games. So those 10 runs account for about 45% of the total runs given up. And that's where we're getting into trouble. It's not that, oh, 30% of the free passes are scoring. It's that those free passes that are scoring are accounting for so many of the runs scored. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on as as we continue to go. It did get a little bit better over the last couple of games. Um, I also looked on the offensive side at the distribution of hits because as I was going through and looking at stats, I saw that Saturday, right, Saturday was uh, – was two runs on 10 hits. Sunday was nine runs on 10 hits. And so in those same games, the offense has had a total of 68 full or partial innings at the plate. Just 13 of those have been multi-hit innings for 19%. 20 of them have been one-hit innings, and 35 of them a full 51% have not had a hit. Now, one hit, no hit innings are not automatically bad. For example, Drew's 12th inning walk off home run was a one hit, one at bat inning. And on Sunday in the fifth inning, the Hoosiers scored a run on no hits with a walk and a couple of uh, sacrifices. So it's it's not impossible for a no hit or a one hit inning to be good, but the more multi hit innings, usually the better. And multi hit innings can also not yield runs. So just something to keep an eye on. Uh, I also looked at the number of times, not necessarily number of innings, but the number of times that the Hoosier offense put together three or more consecutive productive plate appearances. Doesn't have to be a hit. It can be a sacrifice. It can be reaching on an error. It can be uh, advancing a runner who later scores, hits, of course, anything like that. And there have only been 10 times since the start of the Ohio State series uh, where we have gotten three or more consecutive productive at bat or productive play appearances. So only about one and a half times per game. Again, this in and of itself isn't the most useful information out of context, but mixed in there with the fact that the hitting has been a little bit scattered lately could help explain why the offense became a bit more stagnant over this time. And, you know, it, it was there for a week. We were able to win some games, um, but it, it's, uh, it seems like the uh, offense now has found it back and, and, Interesting. I have a question for you. So did you pack your scorecards with you on your trip to Cincinnati just in case you had the time I, or did you have to grab something I, there real quick? No, I absolutely brought it because I figured when I got there Friday night, everybody had been at Kings Island all day and we were just all going to bed. So I could sit there for 
a little bit of time catching up on my scorecard because I was listening to the game across three different states. Only one of them was Indiana. And then uh, Saturday between our events, we had nap time. And so I used part of that, actually listened to the end of the game and did the scorecard for that. Um, but no, I, I didn't know until Sunday that I was going to be able to make it to the ballpark. So I'm glad that I brought the scorecards with me. Very good. I'm glad you did too. And so I, I've accidentally, for our listeners, I've actually done something that maybe a lot of us have tried to do. I've accidentally muted uh, Chris Feeney and, and I'm in the background here trying to get him unmuted. So are you back, Chris? I think so. I'm so sorry. I, I saw something new uh, about how to mute if I had to, and I was uh, attempting to do that, and you had left the camera area, so I just decided to see, and I couldn't unmute you. So That's okay. I apologize. People tell me I talk too much anyway. I am I apologize for that, <laughs> but it's now time for our weekly story. Josh, uh, what do you have for us this week? I think while you uh, muted him, you also put him on the permanent screen right now, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, there. Uh, we'll, we'll take him off, and it should go back to you now when you talk. <laughs> no, that's fine. I don't Sounds need to be seen. That's fine. Um, no, I'm just going to talk about the, the great weather and turnout we had this weekend. Uh, finally had some sunshine at the BART, and the wind wasn't biting too bad. We had uh, over 2,400 people attend each game. And almost 8,000 for the weekend. So it was good to see, you know, if it warmed up and we actually had some spring weather, I think the team would see more support um, that, that they're used to and that we've been able to provide in the last few years. But uh, we had we had fun at the tailgate on Saturday. Um, we saw a bunch of new faces. We had Drum Guy and his crew stop by. Um, and then Dina, our favorite usher there at the park, uh, it was her day off, and as she always does on her days off, if I use playing, she pays for a ticket and comes in, And but she showed up for the tailgate, so that was nice. And then a couple of our friends from the Hoosier.com rival forum, uh, Crazy Hands, brought us some awesome treats from a bakery in, in Washington. Um, and then we had a power supply issue um, there at our tailgate. Uh, we didn't have... A generator to or our power supply malfunctioned and didn't have a way to get the cheese dip warm so we took it down to our buddy chad and he supplied our power to heat the cheese dip and then his son supplied the power late to walk it off and send us all home on saturday night so so that was that was a a neat uh, thing there and then we had two special alumni um phil westfall correct me if i'm wrong on the pronunciation on these brian but phil westfall was a 1965 football alum at IU, and then um, Bill Elia. Elia, right? I, I believe Elia. Okay, uh, Bill Elia. Um, he was uh, he played in '62. He was the shortstop on Bart, Mr. Bart Kaufman's team, and he had his tickets for the day. And, and Mr. Kaufman was sure to hook him up with our tailgate, so that was really special to spend some time with those those two guys and uh, hear some stories. Yeah, it, it was nice to, to meet uh, th those guys. It's always nice to meet uh, people who um, went to, to school there, played uh, because we're fans. And it was nice to hear them and see them talk about their time as, as it was. Uh, for those of you who, who listened to the interview with Bart Kaufman, thank you. Uh, what a great story. Uh, but a lot of great athletes have played uh, for Indiana in a variety of sports. Uh, obviously, we're interested in baseball. And uh, if anyone could connect us with uh, former baseball players, we'd love to have a conversation with them either at the tailgate or through our the wonderful ability to, to podcast. And so that's the purpose of the tailgate is to get to meet fans, uh, stop by the tailgate. We had ushers. We had uh, people who work at Bart Kaufman stop by. We have fans, so alumni, and it's starting to grow, and we look forward to it continuing. The weather would really help uh, if we got some really nice weather. But now it's time to look ahead. We have a huge series ahead of us this weekend at Minnesota. And, Chris, uh, what can you tell us about the Gophers? Okay, it's going to be the Minnesota Golden Gophers. Obviously, it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday series. The Gophers are 28-12. and 12. They're 11-3 and three in the Big Ten, and they're 11-6 and six at home. So they've been playing really well. 
the five Big Ten series that they've won, played and won, Nebraska, Penn State, the team near the Wabash River, Iowa, and Ohio State. And I'd say they pretty much could have easily swept Ohio State because Ohio State came back in the ninth inning down two, I believe. Um, and then they had like five infield hits, an error, and then somebody did one of those A-Rod, push the ball out of the guy's hand moves, and they won the game on that. So it, they really could have swept Ohio State, and we just went in there, and we know how good they were. So this Minnesota team is good. Um, we are both in the top three in the Big Ten in hitting, pitching, and defense. So we're both in those top three ranks. We're very similar teams. Uh, Taryn Vavra is a bat to watch. He's a shortstop. He's actually picked as the number four in the power ratings for shortstops in the country by D1. Uh, he's MLB draft ready. You know, they had a whole write-up on him. He's hitting 385. He's got nine doubles, five homers, 37 RBIs. Luke Peterson is their leadoff guy. Uh, he's hitting 331, 10 doubles, 21 walks, eight steals. So he definitely gets the offense going from the top of the lineup. Now, something to look at as far as their uh, pitching. Reggie Meyer is their Friday guy, okay? He's 4-2 and two with a 3.22 ERA. He's coming off an eight-inning, one-run performance um, against Ohio State. Now, their Saturday guy is really their ace, though. He's the freshman star for this team, Patrick Fredrickson. He's 6-0 and with a 1.61 ERA. He's won three Freshman of the Week awards for the Big Ten, and he's also, on top of that, won a Pitcher of the Week for the Big Ten. So this guy is uh, excellent, okay? In 61 innings, he's only given up 11 earned runs. He's only given up one home run, and that's in 61 innings. So Saturday is really going to be their ace, if you want to call it. But it's not that they're Friday, and that guy hasn't pitched well either. I looked through a bunch of the Sundays, and it looks like they're mixing and matching. So I, I'm not really exactly sure who they're going to go with Sunday. It seems like like seven different guys have started. Um, maybe they're treating it more like a bullpen day or whatever the case might be. Now, something else I was looking at their stats. It's kind of like our strength against their strength, okay? Because our strength, I feel like, is the long ball, okay? Um, we've hit 44 home runs. In 360 innings, the Minnesota pitching has only given up 17 home runs. So now uh, what, something's got to budge here. We're either going to hit some bombs or you know, our offense is going to change. Another thing I noticed with them, we have 631 total bases, okay? And we've scored 266 runs. Now, they, in one less game, actually, have 40 less total bases. So they only have 598 total bases, but they've scored 25 more runs. Now, what does that tell me? They get guys on and they get them in. We've left a lot of guys on. OK, so I don't waste opportunities. I mean, to score that many more runs, to score 40 more runs than us with, I mean, almost what is that? 25. They've scored 25 more runs than us with 40 less total bases and in a less game. They know what to do with base runners. We've had issues with that. They know how to shut down the long ball. Now, if we don't have the long ball, we're going to have to get our base runners in another way. So this is going to be a real interesting series as far as our strength versus their strength, what we do, what they do. I really think this should be a big battle. Now, to go back to what we did against them last year, we had five total games against them last year, if you remember. We had the Friday night massacre where we got killed 11 nothing, and we were starting to think about if we were going to make the tournament at all. Then we came back on that Saturday, and it was a back and forth. I think we won 13-12. It was a wild, long game, one of those like four and a half hour games. And then Sunday, we won four nothing. And Paulie Milto and Tim Heron pitched real well in that game against those guys. So that's something to look at. <laughs> I do have to mention the next two games that we played against them. We're in the Big Ten tournament. Okay. Um, off the top of my head, I don't have it here, but off the top of my head, I know we were winning, I believe, by three or four in the fifth inning in the first one, and we lost that one. I believe we were up 6 nothing in the second one, and I think we were up 8-4 in like the eighth inning of that second Big Ten tournament game. And both of those we gave up. They knocked us out of the Big Ten tournament in our own building. Um, I'd say we owe them a little bit, and I hope we get it this weekend because this is a very good team. Now, again, with their pitching, maybe we can't count on these long balls, 
But, you know, I like doubles too. I like triples. I like getting guys in um, when they're on third with less than two outs. We got to do good situational hitting against this team because they don't make errors. We talked about it. They're top three in fielding in the Big Ten. They don't give up bombs. They got excellent starters. They got a great bullpen too. You know what I mean? This is going to be – I remember when I got real excited. I know I don't want to get Carl mad, but I got real excited before that San Diego series because I was like, oh, this is going to be a great matchup. You know, a lot of good pieces here and there on both teams. And that's what this is. And we're going on the road. Um, Friday night's going to be 7.30 our time. Uh, Saturday, I believe, is 3. Sunday's 2. And Saturday and Sunday are on BTN. So that's pretty cool. We can watch them on TV. Um, let me see if there's anything else on here that I didn't touch on. I think that's pretty much it. Both on BTN over the weekend. And, you know, we owe these guys. We owe these guys. And, all right, if they're not giving up long balls, we're going to find other ways to score because this is a big weekend. These would be big wins for us. They've moved up quite a bit. Uh, I know they were Carl's preseason uh, Big Ten pick. I don't really care what anybody else said. If Carl said they were the team to beat, they're the team to beat to me. Um, let's go out and get them. You know what I'm saying? Let's win a series on the road and, and, and jumpstart the rest of this season and kick that right into that game against UK. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a fun weekend. I really hope we come out on top. I hope we play well. If they beat us, let's play well. Let's do what we got to do with the plate. And that's it. You know, it's going to be a, a, a series where our offense has to be clicking like it was on Sunday to beat their pitching. And it'll be interesting to see our strength, the way our pitching has been dominant lately, how uh, we can shut down their bats because they have some solid bats. So it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, last year it was a lot of uh, scoring and, and seeing if it's going to be high scoring or if it's going to be low scoring affairs this weekend. But it'll be fun baseball uh, nonetheless. So now it's time for our final thoughts. And we'll start off with you, Cassie, uh, your final thoughts here in Episode 13, Week 11 in the baseball season. Yeah, so so my my final thoughts are I'm hoping that that the offensive flurry on Sunday really helps to get the bats going because the pitching has been there, game in and game out. So hopefully hopefully this gets the offense jump started a little bit, uh, and that the guys aren't too horribly stressed out with their finals this week um, as they're as they're finishing up. Good luck to all of them in in their finals. Sounds good. Josh, your final thoughts. Yeah. Just hope that we can get healthy. Uh, it seems like we're getting more healthy right now and, and, and getting there for the stretch run. Uh, Miller got some at bats this weekend and probably had a, had a bullpen and then was actually thrown after the game. I think he was probably available on Sunday. So hopefully, you know, get our guys back to full strength to finish this, uh, this season off. And uh, I, I just want to make sure that we enjoy and appreciate the talent that we have this season. Um, appreciate the seniors, the, the clock's ticking on those guys. And we've got a lot of guys that are being talked about on um, podcasts for the draft. And we've only got four more opportunities to see the, those guys here at the bar. So I just hope that we get the fans out, get some weather to, to get them the support that they deserve for what they've given to us. Um, and uh, just, just hope we appreciate Appreciate them and enjoy it. Yeah, getting healthy is going to be uh, key. Uh, I really think uh, Miller back in the lineup will give us a boost. Uh, and, and again, you you just miss a guy like Paulie uh, Milto. But uh, again, getting getting healthy at the right time of the season uh, should be a, a good sign for for the Hoosiers. Carl, your final thought. I just was talking about uh, some of the attention that the Big Ten has gotten lately, and it's it's really awesome. Uh, D1Baseball.com's Aaron Fit. Uh, was it was watching Big Ten games this weekend. He was with us uh, at the BART on Friday night. Um, Josh and I actually got to meet him. It was pretty cool. Um, and it, you know, for and he even was taking some flack on Twitter because you know, well, why weren't you in Raleigh for the for the uh, NC State North Carolina series? And he's like, hey, I've seen these guys. The Big Ten is a good conference, and they deserve attention. Um, and the league didn't disappoint. Uh, we had a very competitive game. Uh, Jonathan Stever uh, really made a name for himself with what, how he handled those first uh, few innings on Friday in particular. He looked electric. Um, and then, uh, you know, we had a really good, close, competitive game. The BART was packed. It was, it was a great environment. And even uh, Aaron Fit twice on Twitter talked about the hospitality 
that uh, that he had in Bloomington. And then he went and saw the conclusion to a great series uh, over in Ohio. So we know that uh, the Big Ten is starting to get some really good attention. Um, and it's uh, it, it's awesome as this continues. Yeah, it was good to have that kind of uh, uh, coverage and then reading uh, an article today about the, our players and, and the draft, which is always a good thing because you want – uh, players to go. It's always a sad thing because you'd like to keep them as Indiana Hoosiers, but a good coverage. Uh, and for those fans who are looking for good baseball coverage, D D one baseball is a very good website. Chris, your final thoughts. My final thoughts is going to be confidence in his bullpen. Cause I really see these games this weekend being low scoring. I really do. I could see both all three games going bullpen versus bullpen in say a three, two or a four, three game. Uh, B.J. Sable hasn't given up an earned run all year. Matt Lloyd, the same thing. Matt Lloyd comes in, what, 10 in a row, you know, to, to keep that game rolling, 10 outs in a row. I really have confidence in this bullpen. These games are, are going to be won and lost in the bullpen. I honestly believe that. Watch, they end up 13-12, but I really think they're going to be low scoring, hand it over to the, my bullpen versus yours. I'll take Sable, Kruger, and Lloyd. Yeah, and – I, I will piggyback on everything. Uh, it struggles. You struggle as a fan to lose four in a row, but I think the players and the coaching staff struggle even more. They they want to win, and I think Coach Lamona said at one point that the players were uh, angry about the the performance. And I think the sign for for our guys is to uh, each day's a new day, and for our fans, each day's a new day. I know I I probably need to follow that too. Uh, we got a big win Saturday, uh, a big win Sunday, and now. We, we face probably the most pivotal weekend in uh, in baseball, or Indiana does. I'm not part of the teams to say we, but uh, I'm looking forward to a good baseball uh, for the rest of the way and uh, excited about our possibilities of, of moving up in the Big Ten and the RPI. So uh, that will do it for this week's edition of Talking Hoosier Baseball. Please find all these future podcasts on Sports Talk with Tonsoni, which can be found on your favorite podcast source, as well as under the Talking Hoosier Baseball tab on iubase.com. Please follow iubase.com on Twitter. The handle is at iubase17. Follow this uh, podcast, Talking Hoosier Baseball, on Twitter, at the handle at CU at the Bart and visit iubase.com to see other articles and other posts from this excellent team of fans. For the gang, I'm Brian Tonsoni. Go Hoosiers. And in a couple of weeks, we'll see you back at the Bart after a few victories. Thanks for watching. <laughs>